Good evening, everyone. This is Eileen Lynch coming to you from the Hoboken Historical Museum. It's time for Hoboken Talks every Thursday night at 7 p.m. We interview some of Hoboken's more interesting residents. And tonight we will be talking with Professor Lindsay Swindell. She is a assistant teaching professor at Stevens Institute of Technology teaching US history and humanities. And we're gonna be talking to her about some of her interests um, tonight, Lindsay. Hello, Welcome everyone. To the show. Thanks, Hi. Eileen. Good to Hi be there. here. Um, Lindsay, you've been teaching at um, Stevens Institute of Technology. How long have you been there? Almost seven years now. Is that when you moved to Hoboken? That's when I moved to Hoboken. Yes. What do you think? I like Hoboken yeah. a lot. Yeah, I've really kind of always wanted to be in the New York City area. Mm -hmm. And my research on Paul Robeson, you know, is kind of centered in the New Jersey, New York area. So it was a really good location. Sure, because for Robeson me. was a wasn't he a Jersey resident? He was. He was born in Princeton in 1898. Yeah. Wow. When did he die? He didn't die until 1976. Oh, he lived a nice long yeah, life. Yeah, he was long lived. <laughs> and um, I know that you graduated from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Mm -hmm. um, what made you? What made you decide to get into Paul Robeson? Yeah. So. Um, I'll back up a tiny bit. And <laughs> um, so I grew up down south um, in South Carolina. And um, I think that had a big influence on kind of, you know, questions I asked about history. And um, I mean, the Charleston area is really immersed in a lot of history. And as a kid growing up, um, I always kind of wondered a lot of things that weren't talked about, like my middle school and my high school were both named after rice plantations. And I was always kind of like, you know, what does that mean? Um, you know, people didn't really want to talk about it, you know, it seemed. And, you know, a lot of the African-American students in my classes had the same last name as the rice plantations. And I was like, whoa, what is that all about? And again, like nobody was really right. talking about these things. And so I just um, wanted to find the answers to these questions. And that sort of drove me through, you know, a study of history, ultimately pursuing a bachelor's degree at the University of South Carolina. Um, when I was there, I got to study abroad for a year in England at the University of Warwick. Mm. And when I was there, I studied Caribbean culture and literature and Southern African history. And then I got the chance while I was there to travel to Southern Africa for a while. And I did a lot of research on a essay I did on Botswana, spent some time in Botswana. And I began to kind of conceptualize that, you know, there's this African diaspora. Um, and for whatever reason, I didn't really learn about that growing mm -hmm. up. In, in spite of the fact that South Carolina is like a really important part <laughs> of the African diaspora, right? Um, and when I say African diaspora, I mean like, um, you know, all of the places to which African people um, were taken through the transatlantic slave trade, right? So all of that was just kind of like driving my early education. And then after my bachelor's degree, I was like, well, I want to keep learning more. I loved history. Um, I wasn't really thinking about a career. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was like, why don't I get a doctorate? And um, at UMass Amherst at that time, it was one of the only places in the country where you could get an interdisciplinary doctorate um, in African American studies. And that's what I really wanted. And it was really the only place I applied. So luckily I got in <laughs> and um, that really kind of directed, you know, the course of um, study. And then I was like, well, you know, a career would seem to build kind of naturally off of this. So that was where I met Paul Robeson, met <laughs> him. Um, when I was in grad school, I discovered his story and I was like totally blown away. Um, and at that time, there really wasn't a lot written about him. There mm -hmm. were some, like there was one major biography by Martin Duberman and other than that, there wasn't a lot. And a lot of that was because of his um, interactions with the communist left during his life. And so, um, you know, the kind of bifurcated Cold War, you know, um, view of history was really limiting what was written about him. And that, you know, was still going on in like the 90s and early 2000s when I encountered him. And so I was like, I want to 
do something to add to this story. And had you been aware of his work as an actor? No, no, I'd never heard of him until grad school. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Because um, he didn't do very many films. He did do the one, did he do Emperor Jones? He did the Emperor Jones. Uh, he actually did a number of films. Not all of them were released in the oh, United yeah, he States. he was also in Showboat, wasn't he? Right, he was in Showboat. He did a number of films that were um, produced in the UK mm. um, in Europe. And he did a couple of avant-garde things. Um, he did a number of things that were filmed um, overseas. And so they didn't necessarily always have a big U.S. audience, um, even though, you know, some of them, I mean, it's early film, right? right. Um, so a lot of them are still, in our eyes, you know, would seem pretty demeaning as a character. Right. Like Sanders of the River is like, ah, like really hard to watch. But what he was always trying to do was at least get African uh, culture on the screen, right? right. Um, but he actually broke from the film industry in, in 1942 because he was just sick of it. He was like, listen, you know, it's all driven by profit. You know, it's not about actually creating dignified characters for African Americans. And he was like, I'm just done with it. He finally had enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So even though he could have kept making a lot of money in film, he just, he was done. But he really, he had, he had a long career doing Othello. He did. He did it on and off for years. Right, right. So that and was you, the... He wrote the book about that. Yeah, that was... Politics the, of Paul Robeson's Othello. That's right. That was my, So that was my first book. Grand. Politics. And, of <laughs> 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 well, ah, well, there it is. Um, so yeah, I, I'm a big fan of Shakespeare. And that was one of the parts of his life that really, um, you know, kind of compelled me. And um, so I wrote my dissertation and then ultimately my first book on his interpretations of Shakespeare's Othello. So now, the way he did it, he reversed it. He was the only black person right. in the production. Everybody else was white. Right, right. So usually um, it's a white actor when, in blackface. You know. Yeah, that was the tradition in the United States going back to the early 19th century. Um, however, there's some historians who believe that actually in Shakespeare's time, Shakespeare had envisioned him as being, you know, a dark skinned character, um, and not in a demeaning way, but in a way that was just kind of referencing that there was this interaction between North Africa and parts of Europe that was happening because of trade and other things. But it was then the advent of the transatlantic slave trade and its growth that kind of um, changes the whole interpretation of the role, because now you have, you know, this idea of racism and white supremacy emerging from the transatlantic slave trade, mm -hmm. which then really changes how people saw the role of Othello. So then you could argue that Robeson was one of the actors who was trying to bring it back to be seen as a dignified role. Right. He was someone who was a military leader, you know, somebody who uh, was respected by, you know, a lot of the um, leadership in Venice. And so, yeah, to me, that was fascinating. And so in the book, I go into a lot of that history. And then I look at his three portrayals of Othello. Um, two were in England. And then, of course, right, the, the, on Broadway. Right. And then the one on Broadway, which was huge. Um, it was it was and actually was like in the late. 40. It was 40s, in the, yeah. during World War II, actually, mm -hmm. um, which is kind of interesting. I talk a lot about that context um, of World War II because he was very, very outspoken um, during the war. And um, they went on a long U.S. tour, which was actually during the war. Um, and it's still the longest running production of Shakespeare on Broadway. They did 296 performances in New York. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And it was um, it was also a kind of I argue like a socially democratizing event because he had clauses in his contracts like um, there couldn't be segregation in the theater or he wouldn't perform there. Um, and, you know, just the fact of a black actor being on stage in a lot of places was like highly, highly, um, you know, visible and controversial. They didn't even play in the South um, in terms of the U.S. tour, but just being in places um, you know, that were sort of near the South, there would be, you know, um, 
a little bit of dissent and you know tension in the audience. Isn't it interesting? Because of course, at that time there were black performers. But sure. As long as they were singing and dancing, I guess it was fine. But once you get up there to do Shakespeare, wow. yeah, yeah, wow. you're right. I mean, Shakespeare, you know, for a lot of people is like you know the paramount the height of Western civilization. Exactly, exactly. And so Robeson's interaction there was really challenging for a lot of folks. But the fact that he is, you know, really broadly accepted and people came out to see it in droves and it really brought a new audience to the theater, you know, working class people and laboring people and, you know, um, African-Americans and immigrants, you know, wanted to see this because it was a, you know, it was the thing everyone was talking about. So interesting. Yeah. Um, so is, is, did you, because you talk a lot, you also wrote another book mm -hmm. about his life and activism and art because he really was such a huge activist. Right, um, right. I mean, right, all through his whole entire life. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, he came from a family um, that was always kind of driven to speak out. Um, so growing up in Princeton, New Jersey, um, his father had been actually a runaway slave. Um, who ran away from um, slavery in North Carolina, um, came uh, up to the North, educated himself at Lincoln University, ended up preaching um, in New Jersey. And, um, you know, he was somebody who wasn't afraid to, you know, call out the social conventions of the day. And um, so Paul really grew up in this sort of tight knit community of African Americans who were very socially engaged. And that was what, um, you know, really shaped a lot of his early life and his early engagement with, you know, the fact that um, well, he actually he actually compared Princeton to a southern plantation because the power structure comes from the university mm -hmm. and then all of the African Americans kind of do the menial jobs. And so he um, was one to you know, not hide from the fact that, you know, these models are being replicated, you know, and talked about it a lot. That is, his life is, is fascinating. Um, but you've done a lot of work on civil rights. You've done a lot of work on <laughs> civil rights. And it, isn't it interesting that you had to go to England to learn about the African diaspora? And the yeah, yeah, That's right. It is, and in a way, not unlike Robeson, who actually, when he was in London in the 30s, that's where he interacted with a lot of leaders from Africa and the Caribbean. And that's where he really became um, even more politically engaged. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when I was working on Robeson's life, I encountered um, some of the organizations that he interacted with. And I wanted to write about those in my third book because um, they were groups that represent this idea of um, a long civil rights movement. In other words, um, this is the high tide of civil rights struggle in the 1950s and the 1960s didn't come out of nowhere. There's this long history of you know, civil rights engagement in the generations leading up to the 50s and 60s. And so those are the people that I'm writing about in this book, the path to the greater, freer, truer world, kind of like the parents and grandparents of the activists in the 60s. It's really interesting. I mean, because you don't, you think that it was born in like 1960, right, I mean, with right. Martin Luther King, but of course, yeah, there was a whole lead up to that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I know you've done a lot of work on Paul Robeson and you've done some work with um, the New Jersey Council for the Humanities, who is one of our funders. They're <laughs> a wonderful organization. The, National, uh, the New Jersey Council for the Humanities is actually part of the federal National mm. Endowment for the Humanities. Mm -hmm. And um, they have this wonderful program called the Public Scholars Program, mm -hmm. where they have all these experts on particular subjects and organizations like the Hoboken Historical Museum can can book them to come in right. for very low cost. And you actually participated in that program with the Paul Robeson talks. Actually, I didn't do the Paul Robeson talks with them. I did oh. um, James Baldwin with oh, them. I, yeah. I didn't realize that. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> uh, with Paul Robeson, um, I ended up working, I developed a program around um, kind of using his speeches to reach um, young students. Using like, James Baldwin speeches. Um, Paul Robeson's Robeson, speeches, sorry. right. So I um, I work with actor Grant Cooper on that. And um, 
it all kind of started actually in his brother's backyard um, when I had a book talk about Paul Robeson and I wanted to do something kind of different. And so I was like, let's bring some of his speeches to life with you reading them and we'll have some images and stuff. And it went really well. And we ended up um, making that into a whole program and then doing a lot of outreach to schools and um, since 2016, yeah, some. yeah, here we go. Yeah. So since 2016, we've been to, I don't, probably a couple dozen schools, middle schools, high schools, in New, Jersey, colleges. New Jersey, right? Um, mainly New Jersey, well, New York City, um, Connecticut, we've been up to Massachusetts. Yeah. And these have been some of the really most rewarding engagements that I've had, um, you know, we've helped um, schools buy copies of the book and we've donated copies of the book so that the students can learn about Paul Robeson. And I, I love that picture because I was like, hold up your copy of the book and everybody held up their copy. And um, the students asked such great questions and they were so excited to learn about this, you know, really important historical figure that they had never heard of before. It's and amazing they never heard. Yeah. And one time we actually were going up into the Bronx and um, we ended up turning the corner and the school that we were going to, um, the building was named after Paul Robeson. And um, because the school had a different name, we didn't actually realize that we were going to a building named after Paul Robeson. And we were like, oh, my goodness. And that's actually where the, the picture that's the background comes from. So the students had done a lot of um, like murals about Paul Robeson. Yeah. Um, in the auditorium where we were doing the program. So it was like super, super fun and exciting to do a program on Robeson in this auditorium where there were all these murals about his life and the students were really excited. So what was the high school? This was a middle school in the Bronx, um, it was one of the Success Academy charter schools. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. I forget the name of the school. But um, yeah, so those engagements have been really exciting. And then um, a lot of other, we've taken the Paul Robeson story to some other places. Um, I think the next image is from when we were in Boston. With a student? Um, she's yeah, actually, she's... so that's Caroline Harvey with Grant and I, she's a faculty person oh. at um, Berkeley College of Music. We were talking about um, Paul Robeson's music um, at the um, College of Music and the students, again, there were totally blown away because they hadn't heard of Paul Robeson and the spirituals and um, we had a really, really neat engagement there. But oftentimes when we talk about ropes and like these people will come up to us and go like, you know, we have a family connection or my friend works with him or so. And like all these amazing stories wow. have come to us. And so when we were at Berkeley, um, Caroline Harvey comes up to us and goes, my grandfather, Arthur, defended Paul Robeson in Albany whenever he was trying to perform in the 1950s during the McCarthy period and he was blacklisted and her grandfather who was a mainly a labor lawyer defended his right to sing in wow. Albany and she brought that picture of her grandfather with Paul Robes and we were just like floored you know it was so so exciting to meet her and to hear about him and it was interesting because um, when they finally got the injunction overturned and uh, Robeson did perform in Albany, they were like, he can sing, but he can't talk about politics. <laughs> so whenever he would make a statement, he, he actually, he spoke it in, I think, Chinese because he was fluent in like a dozen languages. So he would just kind of like throw them off by, you know, doing something in another language. But that was really, really exciting to meet her. Um, and just let's point out that that's Grant. That's Grant Cooper, yeah, who works with me and the um, the Paul Robeson programs. And we did the James Baldwin programs as well. So the next image, um, this mm -hmm. was a really, really cool event. We were in Princeton at the Paul Robeson Cultural Center on Paul Robeson's birthday. I think this was maybe 2016. And... Um, his birthday's in April, so it was cold and wet and rainy. But this lady, her name was Laura, came out early um, 
And, you know, it wasn't easy for her to get there. You could tell, but she really wanted to be there. And then um, I'm going to, she told us this story about how she was at the peak scale attacks when Paul was trying to sing at peak scale in 1949. Peak scale in New York. Right. And all these vigilantes attacked the concert goers and um, the bus that she was in, the windows were broken and she still had scars on her body from that attack. And she was like, I just wanted to be here, you know, to tell you that, you know, there's still people who remember this and who were there. And, you know, this history is still alive and important. And we were just like, like, wow. it was so moving, you know, to meet somebody who was there and who wanted to share her story, you know, as we were celebrating his life, you know. Right. So, yeah. And these are the things that just like spontaneously yeah. happen. Yes. <laughs> It's awful, but wonderful. It's yeah. wonderful that she was there to tell you. Right. His but, life touched so many people, you know, and we just never know what's going to happen <laughs> when we go. He someplace. lived really in our time. I mean, to die yeah. in 1979, believe me, my kids, it's not that long ago. Um, <laughs> right. Um, so, yeah, you're, you're, you did the, uh, the Public Scholars Program for the New Jersey Council for the Humanities. Yeah. Um, and yeah. those were on your Baldwin articles. Right. So is this, are you in New Brunswick here or where are you? We are in Perth Amboy oh. there. Yeah. So we did with the public scholars, we did a program on James Baldwin. And um, what we did was really just having a, a conversation about um, some of Baldwin's ideas from one of his articles called Nothing Personal. And Grant does like dramatic readings from the article. And then we just really talk and um, again, like just like letting Baldwin's words kind of illuminate um, the session, um, these turned into like really, really meaningful conversations about race and U.S. history. And um, I was so like moved by all of these um, programs that I ended up writing these two articles about the process of doing these programs um, throughout New Jersey. So uh, the James Baldwin Review is um, an international journal dedicated to Baldwin. And I did two articles in there about um, kind of like what we experienced and what we learned talking about James Baldwin. And was this at a school? This was at a YMCA. Oh. Yeah, it was the Perth, sponsored by the Perth Amboy um, Public Library. And, you know, it was really, really remarkable how many people would come out, you know, and like the, in these days, there's like a million, you know, I mean, this was pre pandemic, but you know, there's a million opportunities for entertainment, <laughs> right? right? But to see people want to come out and want to talk about James Baldwin and, you know, really have a meaningful dialogue about, you know, what race in America has meant throughout history was, you know, I mean, it's a privilege for us to be there to facilitate this. And there again, you know, people would come, um, who had met him, people came who had been to his funeral, you know, people came with all these stories right. and they just wanted to share and acknowledge, you know, how this history had touched them. Well, he's a New Jersey resident and you're in New Jersey, so they're mm. going to run into people maybe, right. like, you know, right. I mean, but they didn't grow up with him because they would be really old, but, <laughs> you know, maybe they were 10 and he was 20 or something like that. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of not surprised at a lot. And plus he was such a public figure. He was. He had such a yeah. big public life and such a big public career. Yeah. Um, okay. So one of your, this is, this is, I want to look at this illustration from one of your articles in New Jersey studies. Um, let's talk about this. Yeah. So um, I guess this came out of the summer of 2020 um, and all of the, you know, social upheaval and I ended up writing an article for New Jersey Studies about ways to facilitate discussions on race and social justice, just coming out of my experiences as a teacher and a discussion facilitator. And I came up with this um, diagram, and it's really based on an idea from the great um, activist uh, Frederick Douglass. And in one of Douglass's books, he talks about this idea that slavery is like a poison in United States, um, you know, social relationships and that it impacts everybody. It's not just the slave owners or the slaves themselves, but the fact that there is this, um, you know, idea that people's lives have been completely undermined and oppressed and exploited 
for profit, it really impacts the whole of society. And so I came up with this idea of the poisoned well out of that and thinking that, you know, the drinking water in the U.S. is kind of poisoned. We've all been internalizing these lessons, you know, from institutionalized racism and male dominance and profit over people. And so it creates all of this confusion and division and lack of historical knowledge, et cetera. And I think these are the reasons why it's hard for us to talk to each other. And one of the things James Baldwin actually says is that Americans never really talk to each other or understand each other because they have a fundamental distrust, number one, of themselves and a distrust of each other. And there's no way to really have, you know, a meaningful dialogue without that trust in place. And so I was just making the point that if you want to have these dialogues, you really first have to begin to establish trust, you know, between the people in the room and yourself with those people. And also, you know, really facilitate that as a way of starting to bring people together, right? Mm -hmm. It's not going to be easy, but it's something that I think we really have to do, right? It's, it's, it's really interesting. And it's, it's, it's a nice analogy, the poison. Because <laughs> we all do imbibe from it. Um, so you gave me an article to read. Mm. And I read it. It's in, I'll just tell everybody what it is. It's in the Atlantic. It's called Trust the Teachers. It's from, mm. uh, let's see, I think it's, it's from December, oh, November 22nd. It's called Trust the Teachers. And it's, it's an article about teaching history by David Blight. Yeah. By David Blight. And um, <clears throat> it's a really timely article because we're just going through all the stuff with education, with the pandemic. Right. And parents are making all these demands. And it's like, listen to the parents. They know best. But it's like these people have master's degrees and they're still in working out their debt from the master's degree they paid for. Um, <laughs> And they're experts in their field, but, you know, because giving birth to a baby doesn't automatically make you an mm. educator. Um, but in this article, there was a really interesting, um, I thought a really interesting paragraph, and mm -hmm. I kind of wanted to read some of it. Yeah. It says, parents and Republican politicians should come listen to serious teachers grapple with the question, what is this thing called history? History is not a fable told to make us feel good or bad. It's not a plaything or a pageant of progress towards some goal of equipoise above the human condition. We are always and everywhere in the middle of history. We mm -hmm. cannot escape it. In 1935, W.E. Du Bois made a compelling appeal while writing about Reconstruction. He said, this is a quote, nations reel and stagger on their way. They make hideous mistakes. They commit frightful wrongs. They do great and beautiful things. And shall we not best guide humanity by telling the truth about all of this so far as the truth is ascertainable? I thought it was, it was, I mean, it kind of blew my mind a little bit when he talks about how nations make mistakes and they do mm -hmm. stupid things and they make do wrong things, but then they do beautiful things. It just mm -hmm. made me look at, not just history, but governance mm -hmm. just in a completely different way. I mean, it's mm -hmm. made by people and people are so stupid sometimes, you know, I mean, no offense, all the people out there, but you know, <laughs> they can be stupid and they're running our country, the human beings, you know, it's not, That's they right. could be the smartest people on the planet, but they're going to make a mistake. Right. Um, and it's interesting the way it is taught, you know, and I think about how, like when I was taught history in, you know, I'm talking about like elementary school, mm -hmm. they just, like, I had no idea. I don't, I mean, you know, I didn't even know what happened. Look at the Louisiana Purchase. I don't know. It's just something I have to know on a test with a date. You know, <laughs> there's it, there's no context to how we're taught. And right. we crammed a lot of facts down our throat. But right. the context of those facts, we never really get that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's such an interesting time to be a historian <laughs> because on the one hand, history is animating a lot of the discussions that mm -hmm. we're having. But on the other hand, um, you know, having a discussion about history, a lot of people don't understand is going to be uncomfortable, right? And there's sort of this, I think there's this paradox between like the public um, 
view of what history should accomplish, which is usually kind of boiled down to like a set of myths, you know, here are the heroes, right. here is, you know, the straight, you know, line of progress and everything's always getting better. And these are the people who helped make it so, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then there's what historians uncover, which is complicated and messy and full of vulnerabilities and frailties yeah. and mistakes because history is about people, right? And um, I think we need to do more to maybe bring those two somehow into discussion, you know, mm -hmm. and see that it is complicated and it is messy. And, um, you know, like Du Bois said in that in that statement, that comes from a book um, about reconstruction in 1935 called Black Reconstruction in America. And he was actually arguing that African-Americans were really important in um, being active to end slavery and to build reconstruction. And at that time, nobody was saying that in the country. Right. And so he's really telling a new kind of history that hadn't been told. And, you know, I mean, that's the other part of history is that it's always changing, right? As we learn new things, it's evolving. Mm. And, um, you know, I think that in order to really move forward and grow as a country, we have to begin to get a better handle on these things, you know? Well, it's like that expression. I never really liked it. And I heard a lot when I was in college. History is written by the vi by the, the victors. History mm -hmm. is written by the winners. And it's like, well, that's only half the story then. Right, yeah. Or maybe like a tiny part of the story, not even half yeah. sometimes. And, you know, um, as we learn more about the, the complete story, I kind of think of, I don't know if you remember the old radio announcer, Paul Harvey. He had this thing where he said, and the rest of the story, right? Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, um, we see voiceover yeah, art. Yeah, they know yeah. his thing was, and then from another world or something like that. Because a woman made a made a movie about it. Um, but yeah, we yeah. need to know the rest of the right. story. You know what else is happening here? And I mean, the issue, the, like the tension comes in when when you challenge the the great you know men, the great myth model of history that people have been taught, and you go, well, like uh, there's a lot more to it. You know, that is what frames things like national identity, you know, and yeah. individual identity. And so people are super invested in, you know, those symbols and those stories and those events, whether or not they have, you know, historical documentation to really accompany them. And, you know, I encounter that a lot in the classroom when I talk about things and, you know, we talk about um, like something like Thanksgiving, we have like very, very little information about right. like, you know, about what the menu was. <laughs> yeah. Like 1621, you know, there was a, a meal, but you know, we really don't know a lot about that. We do Except know that they were very grateful to have it. Cause I'm sure there wasn't a lot of food around. Back that's then. true. It you know, they were getting ready for the winter, but you know, we know a lot more about the interactions between settlers and native people was, you know, was violence. That's what was yeah. much more common, right? And so that really complicates then how you begin to see, you know, what was happening in say early America. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's something that is going to have to take time, but, you know, I love what David Blight says is that, you know, teachers, you know, we're trained, right? <laughs> like trust that we're invested in this and that we want to, you know, have this truth telling lead to growth, you know? Um, we're not doing this to like dismantle, you know, your heroes and your icons, but rather to see them more wholly as what they really were, you know, and understand how that impacts us as a nation. It's interesting because of course, then there's the whole women aspect of it because we don't mm -hmm. know what women's history is because nobody really wrote it down that's and right themselves most of them couldn't write so right you know any small little diary you have mm -hmm. for, uh, some woman's history is a big deal yeah yeah absolutely um, yeah i mean who was who was writing who was keeping right. the ledgers you know that's mostly what we have to go on and um you know history that's such a small of, of of wealthy white men yeah, a lot of it is, right? <laughs> um, so this this has been really, really interesting. What are you working on now? Um, what am I working on now? I'm working on an article 
about Du Bois and actually mindfulness. Oh, that's so, right. You've got your, your meditation sessions. Yeah. Yeah. So Are I'm not doing these every week, right? I do. Yeah. These actually started at the museum and then we went online during the lockdown. And so um, we're continuing online now. But I'm moving in the direction now of kind of using mindfulness and meditation as a um, lens to think about personal transformation and ultimately social transformation, you know, um, kind of like uh, Martin Luther King's conception of a beloved community. Like, what could that look like? Um, how might that function, even if we can just achieve little moments of that? Uh, in coming together just as humans, you know, just as human beings and recognizing our shared dignity and, you know, the shared experiences um, that make us human, right? And so I'm starting to kind of use that as a way to conceptualize, hopefully, pathways for broader social transformation. So <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. <laughs> Meditate your way to peace. <laughs> <laughs> that would be nice. Um, it would be nice if we bring, bring things like that into schools, talking about yeah, education. Um, but people think yoga is too like freaky weird. Some places are starting to get into it a little bit. There's some headway here and I there. think if parents saw the effects it has on their kids, yeah, you would be seeing the that parents would be demanding it. <laughs> right. um, well, <clears throat> I want to thank you so much for your time. Thank you. This has been fun. This has been a lot of fun. Yeah. We should have a second part with you. I think there's a lot more <laughs> to talk about with you. Um, really, and so how do you feel like your classes are going up at Stevens? What do you think of your students? The classes are good. You know, I think we're glad to be back in the classroom, yeah. you know, and together. Yeah. And, um, you know, just really taking it one day at a time through this. Are your classes at Stevens electables or are they? So the humanities seminar that I teach, all the first year students have to take a writing and humanities seminar. And then after that, they can take like a handful of um, electives. So my U.S. history classes would be electives. So there's more take. than one U.S. history class. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I teach like the U.S. history survey. I do African American history. Um, I'm doing women's history in the spring. I do a class on 1960s protest, oh, which awesome. is oh, yeah, it's a great class. And it last spring I was using it as a way to kind of think about everything that's been happening in the country right now. Really good. Yeah. Okay. Well, I want to thank you. Thanks, for Eileen. Your time, and um, I think we can wrap it up, Rand. This has been wonderful. If you have any questions for Lindsay, she is at. Stevens Institute of Technology. Next week, we're going to have Eric Kammer. And then the week after that, we're going to have Tammy Faye Starlight. Um, and these have been brought to you um, by Donald Sashet. Donald Sashet was a longtime member of the museum, and he remembered the museum in his will. He was a sweetheart, if you ever want to look him up. He was a total mensch. Um, and the course, the New Jersey Historical Commission, um, we received GOS funding from them and they are big supporters of us and we couldn't do it without them. Thank you, New Jersey Historical Commission, Applied Development Company, of course. Um, they provide the space that we're sitting in. So thank you, Applied. And don't forget to come see our new exhibit, The Avenue, A History of Washington Street. It's up now, it's awesome. It's got all kinds of things in it and you're gonna learn stuff about Washington Street you never thought you would ever even learn ever anywhere. <laughs> um, so thank you again. Oh, don't forget, to, while you, when, you, when you come to the museum to see the exhibit downstairs, come upstairs to see Frank Hanneman's beautiful paintings mm -hmm. um, that he- These are gorgeous, yeah. They're, they're absolutely beautiful. Um, Frank's style has kind of evolved and it's kind of amazing. So thanks for that. Hope of Historical Museum signing off. See you next Thursday at seven o'clock. Thank you, everyone.